Hey guys, so we are now starting chapter 18, representative metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. Um, I want to point out this is a very long chapter. It's a huge chunk of your book, so I'm dividing the lectures up between uh, this week and next week. So this week we are going from 18.1 to 18.6. And then next week we will do 18.7 through 12. Um, it's just because it's a lot of material. I know you generally like when I front load all the lectures, but uh, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, so our starting picture um, is looking at some silicon wafers. Purity is very, very important for these, um, especially in the semiconductor industry. So the first picture you see some technicians that are in a clean room making silicon uh, without impurities. Uh, and then the center picture you see the CEO of VLSI Research showing a pure silicon wafer. It's kind of cool looking, right? And then on the far right you have a silicon wafer covered with Pentium chips. Um, and this is an enlarged version of them that are found in electronics today, so it pur purposely was made bigger. Um, so you can see kind of what that texture looks like. So we're going to jump in to 18.1, which is periodicity. In this section, we're going to classify elements and make prediction about the period periodicity of uh, periodicity properties of the representative elements. So we got some big big words here. So the first thing to know is that we can divide our elements according to their configuration. So if we're, we're looking at the periodic table, two groups down here, we have the representative elements and these are the ones that have S and P orbitals that are the further valence shells. So that's going to be a group 1 and 2, 13 through 18, and then as you'll find out it's also group 12. You have your transition elements, which is this kind of center area, and these guys have d orbitals in their valence, and that are filling up. And then the inner transition metals, which is our bottom two rows, uh, which have f orbitals that are filling up. So our representative elements to start with, we have groups 1, 2, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And the reason that group 12 is, an, is um, part of it, and we'll see the next slide or the one after that, um, even though group 12 is technically also um, transition elements, um, in group 11 their d orbitals are completely filled up. So in group 12 it's actually an s orbital that is there on their valence. So because they end with an s orbital, they are considered representative elements also. So we have metalloids that are also part of the representative elements, um, and these are these have properties between metals and, me and non-metals. We have our metals that form cations and ionic compounds, our non-metals that can form anions and can form ionic compounds as well as molecular compounds, and we know that metals and non-metals combine to form salts or ionic compounds. Um, most of our representative metals do not occur naturally in their elemental state, so I can't just go on a walk and pick up a block of sodium metal. Um, and the reason being is because they readily react with water and oxygen, um, so they form compounds very easily. Uh, a lot of them can be isolated from the minerals they naturally occur in, and, and then they slowly react with air. Um, and they can do this when they react with the air, they, they end up forming a protective barrier, um, and this process is called passivation. So it ends up basically you have your metal, and then it makes a kind of a coating on the outside that helps protect the metal on the inside. So here's the periodic table, kind of showing you some color coding with the uh, different groups. Um, group 12 is right here, and they're both. We can call them transition metals, but they are also representative because of their S shell. Since, in, like I was saying, in group 11, uh, their D orbitals are filling up. So in group 12, now we have an S orbital on our valence. So these are also representative. So let's go ahead and start talking about these representative groups. 
uh, starting with group one, the alkali metals. First things first, hydrogen is not an alkali metal. It is placed above uh, group one, and that's because it has one valence electron. Um, the alkali metals get their name because the metals themselves and their oxides can react with water to make these basic, uh, aka alkaline solutions. Um, so when they react with water, they form hydrogen gas and a basic metal hydroxide. So if you take sodium metal and you put it in water, um, if you add like a phenolphthalene indicator, for instance, it'll the water will turn pink because now it's basic because you now have this hydroxide that forms. And then you'll notice um, some gases coming off that might actually light on fire as because it's hydrogen gas and then the energy that the reaction is putting out is enough to um, have that hydrogen gas react with oxygen. So these group one alkali metals have the largest atomic radii and the lowest first ionization energy in their periods. So as you go from left to right across a period, the alkali metals are going to have the lowest ionization energy, so they're, it's easier to pull an electron off of them. They readily form plus one cations and they are very, very reactive. In general, they have, tend to have a soft texture, so you can kind of cut them almost like butter. Um, and they're going to react with all nonmetals except the noble gases. So when we're talking about all nonmetals, we're not talking about noble gases since those are already um, have their nice valence and are pretty much stable. So when they react with these nonmetals, they form binary ionic compounds, meaning there's just that metal and your nonmetal. There's just two substances in your compound. Now, because of how reactive they are, they tend to be stored under mineral oil, so that way they don't make contact with air or water to react. Um, they're not good for structural applications, so you generally won't see them used in construction. You don't want to have like a sodium support beam because it's too soft. Um, but they can be used to manufacture some metals and organic compounds. And if you were to put it on a flame, they emit colors. So here's some lithium um, in paraben oil or paraffin oil. Uh, lithium actually has a very pretty low density, so that's another thing about these. And it, its density is actually lower than that of the paraffin, which is why it's floating in it. But the paraffin is keeping it from reacting with air or water. So here's some potassium. Um, a lot of times it comes as sticks or beads, and it's stored under oil or in sealed containers. So this is looking like it's a sealed container here. Um, at Cal State San Bernardino, we would do a demo where we would take sodium metal and put it in water, and the sodium metal was in um, xylenes, which is an organic compound that it doesn't react with. It smells awful. If you were to take um, some sodium salts and then put it on a flame, you would notice this very bright kind of yellowy orangey light, which is characteristic of sodium metal. So the different metals emit different colors in a flame. So our next group that we're going to talk about is group two, the alkaline earth metals. So again, this is group two on the periodic table. And this name comes from the fact that their oxides react with water to make alkaline solutions. These have higher nuclear charges than group one. Um, and because of that, they tend to be smaller atoms. And then they have a higher first ionization energy than group one, but it's still pretty low. Um, they're less reactive than group one, but they're still very reactive. They're going to lose electrons to have an oxidation state of plus two. Uh, we can make them via electrolysis, and I forgot to mention that in the last slide. Alkali metals are also made using electrolysis. Um, similar to group one, they also give colors to flames. Depending on which metal it is, they have different colors. Uh, magne the magnesium metal from group 2 can undergo passivation, so if you recall, that means it makes that barrier on the outside. And the group 2 metals re can react with air and water, and um, they're going to form hydrogen and metal hydroxides when this happens. They also are going to form ionic compounds when they combine with acids or with nonmetals. Um, and then what's interesting is when they form these salts, they end up having a very, very high lattice energy. So it's not easy for the water molecules to pull those ions apart for it to dissolve. So because of this, many of the alkaline metal, alkaline earth metal salts are actually insoluble in water. 
another interesting fact is if you have a magnesium fire, do not use a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher on it because magnesium is actually able to react with carbon dioxide. We'll have 2Mg plus CO2 and it makes this magnesium oxide and carbon. So if you go and try to add uh, carbon dioxide to magnesium, you're going to make things worse. Do not, do not try to extinguish a magnesium fire with carbon dioxide. So here we have, um, start at the far left, magnesium metal, um, and then some warm water at a pH of 7, and you put the magnesium in the water, and you get this pink um, solution when you add a phenolphthalein indicator, indic showing us that the pH is greater than 7, meaning it's basic. So now we're going to hop over the transition elements and start with our group 12, which doesn't have a name. <laughs> Um, and these guys are transition elements also, but because their last valence electron is an S electron, not a D, this makes them qualify as representative elements, or representative metals, we call, all the, call, bleh, can also call them post-transition metals. So these actually behave more like alkaline earth metals than transition metals, so they actually have two electrons in their outer shell and form cations that have a plus two charge. Now, in groups one and two, as you go down the periodic table, reactivity increases. But for group 12, it's actually the opposite. So um, the higher up on the table, the more reactive. Zinc is being the top um, most in group 12, and it's the most reactive. Mercury is at the bottom and the least reactive. Um, of the elements in it, zinc and cadmium are the ones that will react with acids and form hydrogen gas. Um, one thing that's interesting is because of zinc's uh, reactivity, it's often used to protect other metals from corrosion um, and used in sacrificial anodes like we talked about um, in electrochemistry, um, as well as it's used to make galvanized steel. Um, so if we were to take zinc and add it to some acid, so we're just going to have just H3O+. Plus. And we're just going to assume it's hydrochloric acid, which is where that Cl- comes from. Um, it's going to make hydrogen gas. Zinc 2 plus, zinc chloride essentially, that's aqueous. 2 Cl- minus, and water. Sorry, I ran out of room there. Um, so zinc and cadmium, one of the reasons, the main reason that they are... Um, able to react with acids to form hydrogen gas is because they have lower reduction potentials than hydrogen. So a lower reduction potential than hydrogen, um, they produce hydrogen gas when they react with acids. And then we have mer mercury, which is just different. <laughs> um, it can actually form diatomic mercury, um, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, it can, it's also a liquid at room temperature, as most of you know. Um, it dissolves a lot of metals, forming what are called amalgams. I hope I pronounced that right. So basically, an amalgam is when you have a, like a, one metal dissolved in another metal. It reacts with strong oxidizing acids. So it needs to be an acid that can oxidize. Um, so it's not going to react with something like hydrochloric acid. Mercury and hydrochloric acid will not react, but it will react with nitric acid. So you have some mercury here, and we give it some nitric acid, HNO3. We end up making this mercury nitrate thing. as well as water, and lastly, some NO gas, um, which is that NO, nitrogen monoxide, is clear, um, it's colorless, but then it oxidizes uh, 
fairly quickly to form the reddish brown nitrogen dioxide. Um, mercury compounds themselves tend to decompose with heat. Um, so if you have some type of mercury compound, you heat it up, it's going to decompose back into mercury, uh, elemental mercury and what other, whatever it was um, combined with. Um, the diatomic mercury, by the way, the formula for it is HG2 2 plus. And as most of you should know, mercury is toxic AF. So um, literally mercury spills could re uh, result in hazmat coming. Um, a lot of times though, you'll hear stories of like parents or grandparents that had mercury thermometers and it broke and they would play with these little, these cool little metal, you know, mercury balls. So that's, that's bad. Um, so again, yeah, toxic is AF, um, just like my ex. I'm not talking about Jeff, he, he's good people. <laughs> um, so here is zinc reacting with hydrochloric acid to make um, a solution of zinc 2 plus and chloride ions and hydrogen gas. So those bubbles that you see in there is hydrogen gas that is forming. And then here we have on the left uh, liquid mercury. Um, on the right you have mercury with concentrated hydrochloric acid. Notice there's no reaction, they're just chilling. And then on the far right, you have mercury with concentrated nitric acid. So you can see the reaction just by that color change there. And that's due to the NO colorless gas quickly oxidizing to form um, NO2. So now we have group 13. Um, and this starts with the metalloid boron at the top and then aluminum, gallium, indium, and Thulium, or sorry, not thulium, thallium. Um, boron is a semiconductor, being that it's a metalloid, and generally forms covalent binary compounds. Their oxides and hydroxides um, of the metals in it, so it's basically everything except boron, can vary in their behaviors. For instance, aluminum and gallium oxides can act, are amphoteric. They can act as acids or as bases. Um, whereas indium and thallium oxides and hydroxides are only basic in their behavior. Gallium, another little fun fact, has a very low melting point. So um, there's this disappearing ma um, spoon magic trick where, you know, the magician has some hot water and they're stirring it with their spoon and all of a sudden the spoon disappears. What's actually happening is it's uh, usually made of gallium and that gallium melts in the in the hot water because it's a very very low melting point if you were to get your ha, hold some gallium it would probably melt in your hand um these metals tend to form ionic compounds where the metals have a plus three charge um now remember that aluminum forms this aluminum water complex which we talked about was it chapter 16 i want to say or 15 um but we abbreviate it just by saying al3 plus um, there is also, though, a phenomena called the inert pair effect, and because of this, it allows them to have oxidation states um, two below their expected value. So they can, some of them can also have oxidation states of plus one due to the inert pair effect. I'm not going to go into what the inert pair effect is, but um, you should just be uh, be aware that this thing exists and it causes it. Um, so that the elements can have oxidation states two below what you would expect. Um, all of the metals react with nonmetals to form binary ionic compounds. Um, we do get passivation with the metals, and um, when it occurs, it's more of a tough and hard outer film. Um, aluminum has some uses in construction, transportation. It's used in cans, you know, aluminum cans, aluminum foil cooking, utensils, it has a lot of uses. So aluminum is very healthy, or not healthy, blah, helpful <laughs> and important. I mean, I guess you could say it's healthy because it doesn't really hurt you, but you know. Um, aluminum is also a very good reducing agent, um, and you'll see later it's used to isolate some metals from their oxides. And now we have group 14. Um, and so this is tin, lead, and fluorovium um, that are the metals of it. Um, we're not going to talk too much about fluorovium. That's one of those synthetic elements um, that is only man-made. Um, tin and lead can form uh, 
generally would form a plus four cation, but because the inert pair effect also comes into play for them, they can also form plus two cations. Um, so our tin are, is going to readily react with our nonmetals and our acids and to where it forms either tin two, um, or it can also react with nonmetals to make tin four or tin two. Lead is much less reactive, and to get it to react, it needs to generally have hot concentrated acid with it also. Uh, carbon, which is at the top of group 14, is a non-metal, and silicon and germanium, which come below it, are metalloids. So um, group 14 has like the whole gamut. The elements themselves in the group tend to exist as allotropes. And allotropes are two or more forms of the same element in the same physical state, but with different chemical and physical properties. So allotropes are kind of cool. Um, so for instance, uh, tin has two common allotropes. It has the gray allotrope, which is very brittle. Um, it's more stable at low temperatures. And then you have uh, white tin, which is very malleable. And when you get above 13.2 degrees Celsius, it becomes the more favored and uh, stable allotrope. Uh, tin has quite a few uses. Um, it's used to coat steel. Um, it's alloyed with copper, which is how we get bronze. And it can be alloyed with lead to form solder. So if you've ever soldered anything, you most likely used a tin uh, lead uh, alloy. Um, lead is very important, has a lot of different uses. One of the main ones is for lead storage, uh, lead storage batteries in vehicles. Um, you can also see lead like for fishing weights and stuff too. Um, so this is showing you tin 2 chloride on the left, which is a solid, and tin 4 chloride on the right, which is a liquid. All right, group 15. We're starting with bismuth. It is the heaviest of the group. Actually, bismuth is really all we're talking about here. It readily gives up three of its five valence electrons to form uh, bismuth 3 plus, and then this is stable because of the inert pair effect. Uh, and now it's only going to form compounds that have an, with an oxidation state of plus five for the bismuth when it's treated with a strong oxidizing agent. So the picture that you see there is a bismuth crystal. Um, it's supposed to be relatively easy to make at home. You can get bismuth, like impure bismuth on like Amazon and stuff, and then you melt it all down and then let it cool into these really cool crystals.